Welcome to this program tonight, sponsored by the Neighborhoods Committee. I'll have to tell you that um, this is another program that has received a lot of thought and planning and reflection. And the two main planners, Marsha Almquist and Peter Shapiro, have tested positive for COVID. So it's such a disappointment because this is a passion they have. They're so knowledgeable and we wanted them to be with us tonight. It also, Peter came to our um, neighborhoods meeting yesterday, so all of us on the neighborhoods committee have masks on tonight because you know we're in that 10 day quarantine period. So, um, but the show's gonna go on and it's gonna be terrific. I don't know if you've been noticing, but neighborhoods has sponsored a series of programs on housing responding to comments and questions that we've heard here at Horizon House. So two, we repeated two shows um, that we had shown before. Um, one was about um, low income housing in this First Hill neighborhood. And then a second one was last week that um, where different people were talking about the housing that's been created in the first program, we really wanted to emphasize the kind of services that are offered to people in affordable housing. So it's much more than offering a building. There's much more that happens. But the conversation that we've heard lately is people have been frustrated. It seems like there's been funds made available for low-income housing, but reading the newspaper sometimes implies that not much is happening. And Peter and Marcia would tell you, no, quite a bit is happening. And it's an interesting timeline from when money becomes available to get the, house, the housing, to get it arranged. But it's also the follow-up of providing the program within the housing. And that's part of the story we wanted to share tonight. So one of the things that they repeat often is that, um, um, Getting housing first is important. Not requiring that people meet a lot of stipulations to move into that housing, but people having a place where it's safe, their belongings are safe, where it's secure, gets them in a place where they ask for other services. And they can speak with some authority about that. So I'm gonna read from something that had been written, permanent supportive housing has proved to open a door to rehabilitation and success for chronically homeless people. Those who you see in encampments that are so controversial in our current discourse. In addition to help permanent supporting housing residents achieve their goals for a better life, permanent supportive housing has proved to save money by reducing the expense for emergency calls, crisis hospitalization, court time and incarceration. So in other words, providing permanent housing actually is money well spent. It um, saves money on some of the other services that would otherwise happen. So we're really fortunate tonight to have two people from um, Plymouth Housing uh, to be with us. Um, and I apologize because I'm saying if those two people were here, they could add details here. Some of you know these people. Christina um, Giscombe has been 12 years at the Plymouth, at Plymouth. Currently, she's one of three senior directors of permanent supportive housing. And Cheryl Du Bois, this is the, her third time at Plymouth. She's started there in 1983 to 87 as the executive director. Then from 1997 to 98, she was the inter interim Chief Financial Officer, and right now she's the Senior Director of Finance. So these two women are intimately involved in this work and they know it well, and we will be smarter and wiser and be more hopeful, I feel, when we leave the program tonight. For this program tonight, we intend for the questions to come at the end of their presentation. It was a lot to ask of the people the other night. They did such a fabulous job, you know, when they took all the questions during the program but it's, it's easier for filming and for other reasons that the questions, unless you just are dying and have to know something. You, 
You, thank you. And remember how we're using these microphones. Do you notice? We're holding up this microphone so when people turn their head, they're turning the microphone with their head. It makes it work better in here. And I want to remind you that when you have a question, even if you have a strong voice, we ask you to wait till someone with the microphone comes to you because then it gets into the T-coil system here that helps people with hearing aids, and it also gets recorded better. So if you could help us with knowing that shouting out the question isn't just about being heard by the speakers. So thank you for coming tonight. We really look forward to your program. Did you know that in King County, more than 13,000 people will sleep outside on a given night? While every unhoused person has a unique story, forces beyond our control put some people at greater risk of homelessness. Because of structural racism, people of color, especially black and indigenous people, are at far greater risk than white Americans. In our region, there's also a lack of mental health resources and a housing affordability crisis. All of these factors and more contribute to the widespread and devastating homelessness we see today. Cities and communities have different ways of addressing homelessness. An unhoused person might find shelter in a tiny house village or get help from an outreach program. There's also something called permanent supportive housing. This is what we do at Plymouth Housing. For more than 40 years, Plymouth has helped single adults leave homelessness behind forever. Residents can receive on-site supportive services like health care and case management. And there is no time limit on our housing. The majority of our residents are people of color. Most are seniors. Almost all have a disability. After someone receives a home, we prioritize their mental and emotional well-being. Activities and community events help them thrive long-term. In fact, more than 95% of people who come to Plymouth remain off the streets permanently. At Plymouth Housing, the annual cost to keep someone housed is the same as a couple of weeks at a King County Hospital or several months in the county jail. In other words, it costs our community more to keep people homeless than it does to house them. At Plymouth, we're making an impact every day on one of our region's most daunting challenges. Because we believe that housing is a human right and that every person deserves to live with dignity. Learn more and support at PlymouthHousing.org. Um, like Janine introduced me, I'm Christina Giscombe. I am one of three senior directors of permanent supportive housing at Plymouth. Um, I started out at Plymouth in 2011 as a case manager um, at one of our first buildings, uh, the Pacific Hotel, which is on 4th and Marion. Um, I was a case manager for four years. I then went on to supervise case managers at a variety of our sites for seven years. And now I find myself as a senior director of permanent supportive housing, where I supervise the entire property of five different buildings in our portfolio. Uh, we've grown over my time at Plymouth and certainly in Cheryl's time at Plymouth significantly. So when I started at Plymouth, we had somewhere in the vicinity of nine buildings. We now have 19. And we went from 120-ish staff to now 400. So definitely growing a lot to meet the need locally. Definitely a lot more still to do. Um, 
So let me just go ahead and jump right into this slideshow. Um, so national homelessness, this is similar to what you all just saw in the video, but on a single night in 2022, 582,462 people experienced homelessness in the United States, which is about 18 of every 10,000 people. Um, so if you think about this, uh, you know, kind of in reference to our region, you'll see here at the bottom that more than half of all people experiencing homelessness in the country were in four states, and Washington is included there. So when you think about when you're driving around and seeing a lot of homelessness on the streets of Seattle, it truly is because we do have one of the worst issues with homelessness right here in our hometown and in our region. Homelessness in King County. So the point in time count is what once was the one night count. So if any of you have participated in the one night count before, that is now this point in time count. And in this, um, volunteers, I've gone before, so including myself, go overnight to different regions where we know that homeless folks stay and we basically tally as many folks as we see in that area. And that all comes together and provides the data that you see here. So in this year's point in time count, there were 13,368 people calculated to be living in homelessness on one given night. Um, if you extrapolate this out to the annualized count, that's 40,871 individuals experiencing homelessness throughout the year. And you'll see over here on the side um, the different uh, issues that folks are dealing with. And at Plymouth, I would say that the majority of our folks have either a mental health disorder, a substance use disorder, or both, which we often recur to, refer to as co-occurring disorders. Um, we do also have the majority of our residents, if not all, identifying as people that have a disability. So here you'll see it was also referenced in the video that there is quite a bit of racial, racial inequity in who is living homeless in our city. Um, you heard reference that Plymouth houses majority people of color. Um, you will also know that by living in Seattle that Seattle is not majority people of color. So there definitely is a huge disparity in who we're seeing represented in the homeless population and the population of Seattle itself. Um, you see the biggest uh, discrepancy with American Indian, Alaskan Native, or Indigenous peoples, um, with them representing 1% of the Seattle population, but 9% of those who are homeless in this area. The other folks that have a big discrepancy are black, African-American, or African people, with a 7% representation in the population, but 25% representation in those who are homeless. So Plymouth's mission, uh, we work to eliminate homelessness and address its causes by preserving, developing, and operating safe, quality, supportive housing, and by providing adults experiencing homelessness with opportunities to stabilize and improve their lives. Plymouth follows the housing first philosophy. We believe that people cannot improve their lives until they have a safe, stable place to live. So for us, the housing first philosophy truly means that when folks come to us, we're going to be as low barrier as possible. We're going to let them in our doors and then we're gonna work with them from there. We're going to meet them where they're at, which is a common phrase that you'll hear used when people talk about things like harm reduction and housing first, is this opportunity to talk with people, learn about who they are, get to know what their needs are, and figure out what goals that they have, particularly now that they're finally under a roof. Because a lot of our folks, when they come to us, they haven't had a moment to think what their goals might be. Instead, they're thinking, gosh, I need food for today. I need to figure out where I'm gonna sleep. I need to figure out what's going to cover me from the rain. You have a roof, you don't have to think about those things. And suddenly you're thinking, gosh, I wanna go to the dentist. I'd like to go get a doctor's appointment. I'm not sure what's been going on with my mental health lately. I better get that checked out. And suddenly you're doing different things. Suddenly you have staff engaging with you and asking you how you're doing. A lot of our residents talk about their experience of feeling invisible in the community, you know, of, of experiencing folks kind of walking by them. And we've had folks come to us at that front desk and say, thank you for saying hello to me every day. You know, that's, that's really valuable to me. I just appreciate that. 
our model of permanent housing, coupled with wraparound on-site supportive services, gives our residents the solid base they need to rebuild their lives and leave homelessness behind them. So as referenced before, by permanent, we mean there's no time limit on our housing. As I mentioned, I've been at Plymouth for 12 years. I know people who have lived at Plymouth for 12 years who were there before I got there. Some of our folks have been there for 30 years. Um, we've been around since 1980. Some of our folks have been there since 1980. Um, so, and they're, they're more than happy to do that. Uh, by supportive, we mean that we connect our residents with services that can help them thrive. So this means both services inside of our walls. So we have case management, we have front desk staff, we have some level of nursing services at some of our buildings, but it also means external services. So we connect folks to things like external case management, doctors, nurses, dental care, mental health care, um, maybe some sort of job support, all of those different things. So who does Plymouth help? Single adults who have experienced chronic homelessness. Chronic homelessness means that someone has been homeless for a consecutive period of time of three years or has had three or more experiences of homelessness in the last year. So it's those folks that are continuously falling in and out of homelessness or it's people who have had prolonged periods of time on the street. So most of the time when folks are moving in with us, they've spent a significant amount of time out in the community dealing with the elements. 97% of our individuals have disabilities. Mental health disability is 58%. This slide says that a quarter of our residents are seniors. I would hedge a bet that it's actually a little bit more than that. 14% of our residents are veterans. 58% um, of our uh, residents have a substance use disability. And 55% are people of color. So again, how does Plymouth support our residents? So I mentioned before we have a 24-7 front desk. This is comprised of people who you know, answer the door, but also are coming up and talking to you if you have an emergency, maybe just coming and checking in with you if you say you need someone to check in with you, someone to have a conversation when you're awake in the middle of the night, and you know, people that just keep the operation of the building going and help people feel safe during that entire 24-hour period. We also have case management, so each case management Manager, and I was one of them, has a caseload. And our caseload is typically somewhere in the vicinity of 25 individuals. And we check in with those folks basically at the pace that they'd like us to. So I would see some people, gosh, all day, every day, multiple times a day. And I'd see some people maybe once a month, right? It was all based around what they needed from me at that time. And I'd meet them where they were at. Now, if you never wanted to talk to me ever, okay, I would say that was fine, I would still come buggy at least once a month and at least just say hello. But people also have the ability to pick and choose whether or not they want to engage with services. They aren't compulsory at our buildings. We also at many of our sites have on-site health care. Right now this is done through an um, outside provider that comes in and helps us on site. So we have nursing offices at several of our buildings. But we are hoping to bring a lot of that on site, and a lot of that is because of what we learned during COVID, you know, when things got strapped and when services really were hard to get, we saw our program end up losing a lot of our partnerships because people didn't have the ability to send folks out anymore. And so our, our hope is to do more of that in-house so that when something like that happens, which hopefully it doesn't happen again, but as we all know, we're still living in it right now, um, we'll be able to respond more ably and not lose some of the services we've been offering. Uh, we also right now have prepared meals that come to our buildings. This is from Fair Start, which is an organization locally that helps to teach folks who are formerly homeless to become line cooks and um, higher up positions within that industry. Um, and then we do have community building outings and activities. And we have a position now that actually is meant to specialize in that. It's called our community specialist. We've hired it at a few properties, not all of them yet. But the idea of that position is to build more outings, more activities into everybody's daily life to give them things to do and to provide opportunities in the community. So, Plymouth is, we're innovative. 
We draw upon research and best practices to develop new programs and enhance our impact. The community specialist position is part of that. Also, when Cheryl comes up, she's going to talk about our Plymouth Crossing building a little bit. That's our new building in Bellevue. So we're branching into the east side, and we're the first permanent supportive housing building on the east side. It's also a building where we're going to pilot a behavioral health program. And behavioral health is the combination of mental health and substance use disorders. And the idea is that a lot of substance use disorders are impacted by someone's mental health and vice versa. Their mental health is impacted by their substance use disorder. So when you talk about somebody's mental health and they have a substance use disorder, you can't always separate those things out. And that's the idea behind behavioral health. And having a program like that in our buildings, on site, able to quickly respond to people and their needs is going to be life-changing for a lot of our population. And we hope to grow it well beyond what we're doing at Plymouth Crossing in a few years. We're effective. As it said in the video, more than 95% of our residents retain permanent housing. That might be with us. They may move on to another site. Unfortunately, that's a little bit fewer and farther between now because wait lists for places like Seattle Housing Authority are eight years sometimes, right? So folks don't always get an opportunity to move into a less restrictive environment, but they do choose to stay with us often. And we're accountable. We have a 40 plus year history of financial stewardship and responsible use of public and philanthropic funds. Again, this was mentioned in the video, but I'll highlight it again. We're compassionate while also being cost effective. So you think about someone spending 16 days in the hospital and what that means for someone. Or you think about someone spending 10 weeks in a King County jail. The jail is still our biggest provider of mental health in this state. So sometimes folks feel like they have to go to jail, they have to do something to get the care that they need. Meanwhile, if they're living with us, we're able to connect them to some of those resources and help them remain stable in the community. Um, the same thing with the hospital as well. Certainly there's things that we can't treat at home, but we will do our best to help people remain home and be able to get the care that they need there. So approximately 1,200 residents at this time so we have uh, that many people who've experienced chronic homelessness that are housed with us annually. We have 19 buildings and we're growing. And we currently have nine on-site health clinics through various partnerships including Neighbor Care Health, Harborview, Swedish, and Vituity and Rely Health. And I believe with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Cheryl. Thank you, Christina. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Okay, I have to start with a confession. <laughs> when I wrote down the dates I was at Plymouth, I was off by a decade. That's embarrassing. <laughs> so I started in 93 to 97 as executive. I think I was the fifth executive director of Plymouth Housing. I went back in 2007 and 2008, and then I'm back now. And I just want to say a few things about why do I keep going back. Every single time I've been uh, back at Plymouth, we have deepened our commitment to the support services that we provide to people in the community. When I was, uh, and I'm really sorry, Marsha's not here. She was on the board of directors when I was the executive. And we talked about how during her time and my time, my first time at Plymouth, we were evaluating whether or not we should provide services. We were a housing provider, not a service provider. We were also debating how long should we have people in our housing and thinking that they should move on to somewhere else. But during the time that we were both there, both Marcia and I, we, dis we decided, uh, the board, that the, the success of residents was that they were there long term. We had no goal to move them out. And we did start um, deepening our commitment to fundraising and supporting uh, the supportive housing services that you hear now. So when I was back in 2007 and 8, we were providing the housing case management. And now, as you just heard, we're doing a lot with behavioral health. So we've, um, we're hiring nurses. We've got a clinical director. We're going to have more and more people at all of our buildings uh, that have deeper services and deeper partnerships. Okay, so with that confession, 
<laughs> we'll move on to the next slide. So um, Christina mentioned that we're growing. We opened three new buildings in this past year. So one is the new building she referred to that I'll talk more about in a minute. It's called Plymouth Crossing, and it's our first building out of the city of Seattle. It's over in Eastgate. Um, another we bought is called Toft Terrace, and it's in Ballard. And the third one that we opened is uh, Blake House, uh, named after uh, Blake Nordstrom. And that is a high-rise building on Capitol Hill that we did in partnership with Bellwether Housing. So Plymouth Housing has the first five floors of the building, and Bellwether Housing has the next uh, floors, which go up to the 13th floor. So first high-rise affordable housing building in the city. Um, as well. Uh, let's see, so what's ahead? We're, we have a couple more buildings that are under development right now. We have one called, uh, that's in Kenmore, uh, that is under development, and we're also going to be uh, renovating one of the buildings that Christina worked at, Pacific Hotel, uh, which is also the first building that I did the development on when I was the executive. Um, so that's an SRO building, and this SRO stands for Single Room Occupancy. And during the time I was executive, it was one of the goals of downtown to preserve these old turn of the century single room occupancy, what used to be hotels, and turn them into affordable housing. And now what we found is it's a lot more effective in terms of helping people in their housing uh, and providing support services if they have their own bathroom as opposed to the single room occupancy uh, units that have bathrooms down the hall. And so we're not uh, finding as much success with those and we're renovating those to turn them into studio and one bedroom apartments. Get the right side there. There we go. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about uh, Blake House. Blake House, as I mentioned, is named after Blake Nordstrom, uh, who's been a strong supporter of Plymouth Housing for years. Uh, and it opened in May. It was built on donated land, so Sound Transit has had a number of sites over the past uh, five or so years that they have put out for bid to have affordable housing built on those. And this is one that Plymouth Housing and Bellwether went into partnership on and uh, submitted a bid and won the award. So the Sound Transit entity donated the land uh, and it was named after uh, Blake Nordstrom then and we built 112 studio apartments uh, for seniors and veterans who've been chronically homeless on that site. And then as I mentioned, Bellwether Housing, who does affordable housing, not so much for uh, homeless folks, but for individuals who are a little higher income but still working poor. Um, and they built 250 units above on the top floors. And we've got a lot of on-site uh, care and a partnership with Swedish at that building. So that's a beautiful building if you haven't been by. Uh, would invite you to go by and take a look at it. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how do we fund these buildings. Uh, so this is an example, uh, pretty similar for many buildings, of the types of funding that we get. So we go through a competitive process. It takes um, applications to each one of these funding sources. They all have different criteria they use to score, to decide whether or not you'll get funding. Uh, one of the things that they score highly, for example, is serving the lowest income people in the community. Uh, and people who have disabilities and high needs. So Plymouth uh, scored well on this. We have money that we got through the Washington State Housing Finance Commission, and that's the entity in this state that is designated to allocate the tax credits, low-income housing tax credits. Uh, that's what LIHTC stands for, low-income housing tax credits. Uh, so they do a scoring system and allocate those tax credits to entities that are building housing, and then the housing organization sells those tax credits to an investor, uh, and that's typically a bank or a national equity uh, fund who goes out and gets other corporations who are interested in tax credits um, to buy the credits. They literally take the credits against their tax liability and they give us money up front to help build the housing. So 21 million of our funds for Blake House came from the low-income housing tax credits. Uh, the city of Seattle Office of Housing gave us 13 million and they have several sources of fund, but the largest source of funds is uh, by far the Seattle Housing Levy. Um, and there's a new levy coming up, so I'll talk in a minute about that. 
Uh, and then King County uh, Department of Community and Human Services put 3.4 million into Blake House. Uh, and then uh, the, the uh, transit uh, site donated the land. So the 2.6 million is the land that they donated to Plymouth that we donated to uh, the building. Uh, then we have the proof campaign. That was a capital campaign. Plymouth ran a few years ago. We raised $59 million uh, to build six buildings, and this was one of those. We still have a little bit of money left over to renovate our single room occupancy uh, buildings as well. The Federal Home Loan Bank um, put some money in at a $750,000 grant, uh, and then we have some developer fees that are deferred to support the building as well as some miscellaneous others. So $47 million to support the uh, building of Blake House. And then Blake House um, operating budget. So you heard a little bit from Christina about the staffing, uh, but the full staffing list for Blake House, which is similar to almost all of our buildings. Most of our buildings are permanent supportive housing that Christina just described. We have a couple buildings that are kind of graduate housing. So if people are ready to move into a building where they don't need as heavy a support, we have a couple of buildings that support that, like Sylvia Odom's place is one of those, for example. So at Blake House, the staffing is one site director, one resident services manager, three housing case managers, a lead housing case manager, six resident specialists. The resident specialists sit at the front desk, and that's the 24-hour coverage that Christina referenced, and a lead resident specialist. And the cost per unit um, per year for that building, similar to all of our permanent supportive housing uh, buildings, is about $25,000. So again, what uh, was referenced a couple of times during this presentation, that's cheaper than having people in and out of the hospital all year, year after year, or having people in and out of jail. And our operations are funded by, mostly by um, grants. We do have some rent, but as you might imagine, residents who are homeless cannot afford to pay rent. So we have some buildings that have rent subsidies attached to them, so the uh, the rent subsidy through the city or HUD provides most of the rent income, but disproportionately, since we're deepening our commitment to services, we're now funded by grants. So Plymouth Crossing is another building that we opened, and that one, as I mentioned, um, is on the east side, so it was opened in July, and it's our first building um, on the east side. And it's part of an east side housing campus that includes a men's shelter um, as well as uh, low income housing. And it's going to be, uh, it is a home for 92 adults um, who have access to on site health care as well. Um, and the referral partnership there is with Porchlight and uh, the Sophia Way. So, behavioral health. Um, we're, in, we're investing in this across our entire portfolio, but Plymouth Crossing, we're doing a lot of uh, pilot and research work at that site. Um, so we've got a pilot program that we've launched to bring the integrated health care, and as Christina mentioned, that covers uh, both the substance abuse and mental health services. So we're partnering with Vituity and Rely Health there, uh, and we have on-site uh, nurses, nursing care, a clinical um, master's in social work. Uh, we've got medication management. We've got lifestyle uh, and skill building, recovery services, chronic disease management, uh, psychotherapy, mindfulness. Um, and uh, this program is a part of a research pilot. So we, we're working in our portfolio with a number of organizations doing research. One is the University of Washington and Washington State University as well. So really looking at the effectiveness of these programs and what model are we using that can provide the biggest impact and uh, lower the scores that people have for having to go you know, back into the uh, mental health uh, system or substance abuse system. So we will be monitoring those scores and seeing what's most effective and applying that across the entire portfolio. That didn't go forward, did it? There we go. Um, 
Okay, so now I'm going to shift gears a minute. I mentioned to you that our building, in the example I gave you, had Seattle housing levy money. Um, almost every building that we've done in Seattle, which have been all except um, now Plymouth Crossing and the new one we're doing in Kenmore, uh, almost every one of them has a significant amount of Seattle housing levy money in it. Um, so it's a really important resource, and you'll see uh, coming up for a vote this next year will be a renewal of the levy. The levy's been in place now, I think it's 35 years. I should have that on the top of my head. Um, and what has happened every single time there's been a levy is we've produced more as a community than was promised in the levy, more affordable housing than was promised. Um, so this new levy, uh, because of all that success, is going to be larger than any we've had in the past. It'll be $970 million, uh, and 50% of the levy will be for uh, homes for residents of color. And the levy is going to support uh, both rental housing, um, operating and maintenance funds to help run the operations, some home ownership dollars, uh, preservation and uh, housing stabilization money, and also funds to be able to acquire and preserve affordable housing that's in the community at risk of converting to market rate housing. Um, so you can see out of that uh, pie, I won't read every one of them, but you can see how the money split up between those pots. So it's a, a really important um, uh, vote this uh, November. I encourage you all to get out and vote always. So with that, that was the end of our prepared remarks. Happy to take questions people may have. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, Christina, that you said that uh, residents sometimes choose to move out to less restrictive housing. And I wondered what you meant by less restrictive. What restrictions are there? Sure. So um, in our buildings, uh, besides the two buildings that Cheryl referred to, which are our graduated buildings, you do have some level of, um, you know, you have this 24-7 staff, right? So there's controlled access to the building. You also have uh, guest requirements, right? So individuals who live in our buildings when they come in, they need to sign in the people that are visiting them. And they can only have two people visit at a time. They can have three overnights a week. When you move into our graduated spaces, when you move into something like Seattle Housing Authority, you're in a little bit more of a traditional apartment setting where you don't have those restrictions on you. And some folks chafe a little bit at that rule specifically. Um, a few other things like, uh, you know, kind of case management engagement more frequently, right? That kind of thing. Um, so when individuals are ready to kind of move on from our more intensive services, that's when they might, if they're really successful, look at graduating into what we call our next steps, our PSH Next program, where folks end up in, in buildings that we own ourselves, right? And we do have two of them. They can't house everybody that's ready for it, but at least some people. Um, and in those buildings, folks don't have the guest rules. Uh, there's a little bit less staffing. Um, there's a little bit less case management available. There is some, but the idea is that those folks have shown that they're able to really function pretty independently because the idea of a lot of, it, it is independent housing, but it's independent housing with a lot of support behind it. And so there's just a little bit less support and a little bit less of that kind of, I don't know, loving in your face help <laughs> that we have at our other properties. What is the location of Blake House? Uh, it's at the corner of Madison and Boylston. Okay. People have referred to it sometimes as Mad Boy, which I'm not crazy about that reference, but it makes it easy to remember. <laughs> um, can you just say, give us a rough timeline for how long it takes to bring something like Blake House or one of these big buildings online from conception to end? Or to how to you know, operating to um, operating? Yeah, that's a that's a really big question, and it I'll say it takes longer than it should, um, and it varies pretty dramatically depending on the situation. So, uh, with the example of uh, Blake House for 
um, for one example, it was a transit-oriented site, so there was a whole process you had to go through to apply for the site uh, and win that award. So Plymouth and Bellwether did that, and that took a couple of years. And then you have to apply for all these other funding sources, which we try and, um, you know, all of the funders coordinate with each other. So if the city of Seattle is supporting a site, it's a lot more likely the state of Washington is going to support it. Or if King County has money, they'll support it. Uh, so that you don't end up with funding from one local jurisdiction and not others, and therefore you can't complete the building. But you do have to go through applications for every one of those, and they have slightly different time frames. Um, so you, you've got probably another year to tack on for those application processes if you're successful the first time. Sometimes you have to go back a second time um, as well. Uh, so it's, it's pretty uh, reasonable to say from the time you identify a site to the time you're uh, in construction and place it in service, you're going to be at least a four to five year window. Sometimes longer, we might work with some of the local um, organizations on a, a site that they're thinking about, and it, it could take a few years to work with that group before you get access to it, but I would say at least four to five years is the typical. Construction is usually about an 18 month, depending on the size of the building, 12 to eight, 18 month um, cycle, and you've got the design uh, and permitting before that and the funding applications before that. I'm, I'm not clear. So do you, take o do you take over buildings that exist, empty? Do you build, are these new buildings built from the ground or? We do both. So one of the earliest things um, that Plymouth did was buy existing buildings. And uh, you know, it was founded from Plymouth Congregational Church and so volunteer members would go in and help do the painting and renovating of the building and operate it. So that was our early beginnings. We bought existing buildings, a lot of old hotels, the single room occupancy hotels, and we renovated those and, and brought people in off the streets to live there. And what's happened more in recent years is in addition to doing that, we do still buy some buildings, but there aren't that many um, sitting on the market to buy. And so we're now building uh, buildings. So we're, uh, we're still doing both, but more of our buildings right now are new construction. Uh, and then some of it is renovating existing buildings that have been around now for 30 or 40 years, like the Pacific Hotel, which was open, actually I remember the year, because my daughter was born, 1995 is when we opened the Pacific Hotel, and now here we are uh, renovating it. How much do the residents contribute to the care of the building? So we do have individuals pay rent, as was referenced before. Most of our residents are individuals receiving Social Security, and it's typically supplemental Social Security. So it's not from having worked for a period of time, but it's what you get if you have a ongoing disability that prevents you from working. So typically our folks are extremely low income and they're looking at an income of around $900 a month. So when they're paying rent, anyone who pays rent in our buildings is paying 30% of the income that they make. So typically that means that folks are paying in the vicinity of around $300. So there's that way that folks contribute to the building. Um, there's also opportunities for folks to participate. A lot of people will volunteer in helping to clean the building, right? So we might have folks that help with uh, preservation of what's happening in the outer areas of the building or helping to clean up um, like the night shift if they're, you know, out and about and wanting to do something. Um, also, you know, sometimes our um, community events end up being things that are also to, let's say, like beautify the building, right? So we might end up with folks doing art projects during those events, or we've had people come in and do like photography events and then, you know, put those pictures up in the building. So um, those are just a few ways that folks contribute um, to what the property is and what it looks like. I have two questions. One is if someone is drug addicted, do you make them take rehabilitation or can they opt out? And the second question is, what are the criteria for, for admission to uh, one of your homes? Yeah, so I'll answer um, in order. Um, so we do operate under what we call a harm reduction philosophy, right? Which again is that idea of meeting folks where they're at. 
So if they come into housing with us and they're in active addiction, we're not going to insist that they stop immediately. What we will do is help provide opportunities for them at every juncture to make a different decision and also to make whatever decisions they're going to make safely. So you think about you know, projects like giving folks clean needles if they're using substances. You also think about you know, what we've hear, we're all hearing a lot about fentanyl right now, right? And all the overdose risk in the community. So what we've done as an organization is make sure that we have Narcan available with our staff, with our residents, flooding the building. Because you can't pursue recovery and sobriety if you've passed away, right? So the idea is to work with folks to have them be safe and then eventually, our goal is to have everybody thrive in whatever that looks like to them. And for a lot of folks, that does eventually mean achieving some level of sobriety. And for some folks, that just means thriving in the state that they are right now, and that's okay. And as far as how folks qualify for our housing, so again, most of our buildings require chronic homelessness. And then they also need to be able to fill out paperwork that qualifies them for housing with Seattle Housing Authority. Because as Cheryl mentioned earlier, a lot of our buildings are subsidized by Seattle Housing Authority. So yeah. folks pay their $200, $300 of rent, and then Seattle Housing Authority subsidizes the rest of it for us. And um, so they have to fill out paperwork with our rental office when they're coming through that process. Um, we're beholden to coordinated entry for all, which is a system that kind of funnels everyone that's homeless in the city into one big pool of applicants. And then they get funneled to us that way. And so at that point then, they go through our housing application that both gets reviewed by Plymouth and gets reviewed by the Seattle Housing Authority. For a building like Plymouth Crossing, that's in Bellevue, they actually get reviewed by the King County Housing Authority. So they have to meet their requirements to live in their housing. Um, there's not a ton of requirements within that. You can't owe either organization a lot of money. Um, there's a few other things. I believe that you can't have um, any like meth manufacturing in your history, that kind of thing. Um, but again, they kind of work with us on being pretty low barrier with people. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, in a 10-minute walk from here, we run into as many as 15 homeless people right in the park. Uh, is it, should I say, have you heard about Plymouth Housing? You know, uh, what is the process for people getting in? Yeah, so I would actually direct them to applying for coordinated entry. So that's done through a building on 23rd and Yesler, actually. I can find the phone number for you all before I leave because that's good. a really good way to get people Great. connected mm -hmm. if you're talking with them and they're like, hey, I really wish I knew how to get into housing. That's where they start. And then from that spot, that's when they get referred to whatever program they're going to, that's going to have a vacancy. Good. Thank you. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you were interconnected with the uh, screening process and the monitoring process of Seattle Housing Authority, and you are. Um, in many of these developments, I was a member of the Historic Seattle uh, Council for 18 years, and we did some projects, as you know, over here. And uh, so I'm pretty familiar with tax credits and all that. So do you have, a, you do not have any limit on your, uh, on your uh, tax credit stuff uh, I mean, these are complicated financial things, but I think it would be really helpful to do a community uh, PowerPoint. By the way, it would be really helpful if we had sunlight or daylight, you know, uh, spotlight on you guys. Um, but if you had a more uh, detailed, I don't mean, you know, spreadsheet, but a more detailed explanation of the review process. If somebody's grandmother dies and leaves them two million bucks, and there, are, you know, there should be some review process yeah, there um, is. that they may be, find a better solution for their housing than some place where someone is truly indigent. But I mean, again, the Seattle Housing Authority has a process for that. I believe every year someone's 
income is reviewed. And there's all kinds of people with SSI and veterans benefits. And there's other stuff. I know you guys probably um, go through that carefully with every mm -hmm. resident, which, of course, I'm asking Republican <laughs> questions. But I mean, I think it would be important for you <laughs> to very to explain these kinds of of things that people care about. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy and to do that. And asking someone who's in a tent to get a phone, to give them a phone number is kind of not helpful. So let me, let me address your question about, um, yes, we have both low-income housing tax credits and in some cases historic tax credits. The Pacific Hotel, we did historic tax credits when I was involved and we're doing it again. In both instances, when we apply for uh, tax credits, which come from the IRS, they have strict guidelines. So the competition requires that we identify what income level we're gonna serve. Um, so there is an income screening that happens and our buildings are almost all 30% of the area median income or below because if you're homeless, you're not gonna be at an 80% area median income. So we identify in the, that application process that our applicants will all be below 30% of the area median income. We also identify set-asides, and again, this is part of the scoring criteria. So because we're serving chronically homeless, we're going to identify most of our units for chronically homeless, depending on the building, it might be all of the units. And so every year when the screening happens, people have to go through a process and, and uh, certify their incomes, and if they're homeless when they come in, they're obviously not going to be homeless after they're there, uh, but they had to be homeless coming in. We also do set-asides for things like the mental illness, um, and so there are a number of set-aside criteria, and these criteria get reviewed every year by the Washington State Housing Finance Commission and their ad advisory uh, and public comments, and so the criteria change from one year to the next. Uh, but we have to compete for that, and then we have to, for the period of time that we agreed to provide this housing, and we make commitments to the Housing Finance Commission, to the City of Seattle, to the State of Washington, to King County, anybody that funded us. So typically we have a 50-year commitment, and it's recorded on the building's deed, so it's not something you can just move the building to somebody else and get out from under it. It's a 50-year commitment that we have to live with, and there are serious consequences. If you don't, for example, you could get tax credits recaptured and have a lot of liability to pay back uh, money. So it's a very rigorous, uh, regulated, uh, administratively burdensome <laughs> yeah. process, but um, we're accountable for it. I, ju I just wondered, uh, when a person has been identified or has identified him, himself or herself as someone who would probably be qualified and interested in this housing, roughly how long does it take? It sounds like it could be an arduous and lengthy process. I mean, that's exactly it. It's an arduous and lengthy process. And um, individuals that get referred to a, an apartment have an opportunity, I think they get three opportunities to say no and turn down the apartment they've been offered. So let's say it's in a location that they can't live in or for whatever reason they aren't comfortable with the amenities that are offered to them. They get the opportunity to say no. So that actually lengthens out the process a little bit too, right? Because you think about all these people on this list, if they have to keep calling that same person a couple of times to get them to re-engage, um, that's, that's some time uh, spent in that process. There's also a committee that meets to review people that have been put into that uh, coordinated entry system. And so typically they try to place folks where they think they will be most successful. Um, and then individuals get the opportunity to view those sites. So I don't have a good answer to that question. I don't know what the average is, but you know, I'm, Given what I know about like Seattle Housing Authority wait lists, which are very long, my thought is it probably takes from you know the point where you actually manage to get in, get an appointment. As was referenced earlier, you know you give someone a phone number, they don't always have a phone. They might have to find a case manager to help them. Right? There's all of these barriers in the way, and then once you get on the list, then you're on it for a minute, and you have to be accountable to your phone or to your case manager or to whoever it is that's helping you stay connected so that you know 
when that housing is offered to you, right? So um, I, I wish I had a better average timeline, but best guess is at least a year, if not a little bit longer. Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, well, there. How about that? I think there are some of you who remember Simon's house. Is that still in existence? We used to um, have a big group of us who made a lunch once a month and cooked it and took it down and shared it with the people there. And it was an absolutely fun, fun activity. We played bingo and the prizes were all beautifully wrapped. It was very exciting. The prizes were toilet paper, but they were excited about that, too. <laughs> so anyway, we've had some great experiences. And I'm glad to know Simon's house is still going. Yes, it's the Langdon and Ann Simon's house. She's asking if that's Good. still in existence. And it, it is. Uh, and in fact, it's where our administrative offices are. So what used to be commercial space, uh, Plymouth Housing has taken over, and we occupy that uh, for our administrative offices. So the Langdon and Ann Simon's uh, senior housing um, is still on 3rd and Blanchard. And we'd welcome people to come back and do activities there anytime. What other questions can we answer? Can't hear. I have two questions. One is, um, I think I read in the Times that they were having trouble getting staffing and people to manage mm. some of the housing. Mm -hmm. Are, do you have a plan in place and can you house, uh, manage more places than you have now? And are you, the second question is, are you full services in your properties? Meaning, um, you know, whatever the need is, you can find it for someone. Um, let me answer the staffing question and, and, and hand it to Christina to answer your second question. So I want to start with, um, you're probably all familiar with the Seattle Jumpstart tax that was put in place. Um, it's, it's on anyone who earns in the city of Seattle 150000 or more um, gets a tax that the city collects. A few years ago, Amazon um, kind of threw a fit about that and uh, and so they got into negotiations and ended up putting in place, anyway, this jumpstart tax. And so the city's been collecting that now, and what they did uh, this year is they put out the money to permanent supportive housing organizations to help us increase salaries. So I think we all found through COVID and the pandemic that we understand differently who are essential workers. And during the pandemic, if you're a maintenance person, uh, and you needed to have a job, you couldn't do maintenance work remotely, right? So our staff in permanent supportive housing were on site supporting residents throughout the whole uh, COVID. And we've had horrendous trouble keeping staff. Uh, we had 111 positions open at one time. So the city of Seattle has taken that jumpstart money and given it to permanent supportive housing organizations to increase salaries so that we can keep staff and recruit staff. So we, this year, gave a 20% raise to all of our frontline workers. Um, yes, it was fabulous. Um, we got six and a half million from the city in July. We gave people a raise back to January. Um, so we have a lot of happier <laughs> employees and we're having a lot more success recruiting employees um, who are working in really difficult situations. If you can imagine being a person who's cleaning a permanent supportive housing building where a lot of things happen that you probably don't want to hear about, uh, but they have to clean up. Uh, and so it was fabulous to have that money. So I think we'll have a lot more success. Uh, we are having more success and we'll have more in the future because of that money. And then I'll let Christine answer the other question. Yeah, I'll also add to what Cheryl was saying as far as, you know, raising people's income, also just raising what you could call quality of life at work, right? So Plymouth has always been a really good place to work. That's what keeps me there. But there are difficult things that happen. And so we are 
constantly evaluating when those things happen, how we're engaging with staff, how we're talking with them to build resilience so that when something happens, they're able to work through it and be able to come back to work, right? And that's done through a variety of ways, um, including you know opportunities to debrief and engage after an incident and also things that we call wellness days. So once a quarter, we encourage staff to use a day off, they get a PTO day that is explicitly for taking care of themselves, right? Because we know how difficult this work is. So options like that, we keep looking into things that we can give to our staff to recognize their hard work, recognize that we you know, are doing jobs that require a lot of us and helping them be able to take some time for themselves is really important to us as an agency and is helping us become an employer of choice in the region. Um, as far as being a full service organization, we try to be, um, you know, depending you know, on what the person needs. So you know, we have a lot of folks who are maybe interested in reconnecting with their families. A case manager might sit down with somebody and do that. We have folks who aren't connected to benefits yet. That can be an hours and hours and hours long process and folks will get people started on that road, connect them to benefit specialists and stay connected throughout that process. We have individuals who have ongoing you know, weekly or monthly appointments where they need someone to help them understand. Case managers might be helping do that. You know, we have folks that are on dialysis that need someone to go up and check and knock on the door because the person didn't show up for dialysis appointments. We have folks doing that, right? We have folks connecting people to substance abuse treatment. We have folks getting people, you know, somebody might wanna go to the museum and getting folks museum tickets. Um, and I have what might seem like a kind of trite story, but we had a resident who, you know, was certainly dealing with a lot of things and had, had you know, their own mental health concerns going on. And we always sit down with people when they move in and we ask them what their goals are. And this person's goal very firmly, and they very much believed in it, was to meet Bruce Willis. And that was what they wanted to do. And so you're sitting there and you're having this conversation with somebody, and it's really easy to say, Phew you're never gonna meet Bruce Willis. Let's, let's find a more down-to-earth goal. But the person who was working with this person said, okay, you wanna meet Bruce Willis, what are you gonna need to do to get there? Well, I'm probably gonna have to drink a little bit less, and I should probably take care of my teeth because I don't want him to be like upset when he sees me, you know? And, and maybe, I should, maybe I should take good care of my hygiene Right, and so these, this really outlandish goal can be broken down to things, you know, the person didn't ever meet Bruce Willis, unfortunately, but, you know, they took these other steps. And, you know, when you, when you get these big lofty goals from people, there's small steps along the way that we can help people break down to and help them get where they wanna go. Hi. Um, I, I love the human interest stories, and I appreciate so much what you have done. And I have toured at least one of your projects. What can be done to cut the red tape around financing? <laughs> Did you see that action? She said scissors. <laughs> um, you know, in all seriousness, there are um, a number of things that uh, we're involved in and have uh, continual work on. There's a, a consortium called the Housing Development Consortium of Seattle and King County, and that group is a lot of affordable housing organizations and a lot of the, um, the banks that fund us and um, architects and, and construction folks that are involved. So they have a lot of ideas and they work with the Housing Development Consortium to lobby uh, and coordinate with the various funders around here to try and address some of the things uh, that cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. Um, so, you know, things like how much parking is required when you're building a building for people who don't have cars. Uh, so there are lots of things like that that the Housing Development Consortium has lobbied for in the past many of which have been successful, and more that they'll do um, in the future. So I think that's one of the things that we'll continue to do is be involved in the consortium so that we can um, make those statements. And then our um, CEO and senior leadership are often out there talking to city council members and the mayor's office and 
with public safety, the chief of police and others to lobby for things that make um, operating and building our buildings more cost effective. Housing Development Consortium. It's a great site. It's a nonprofit, and they have a lot of information on their site also about, uh, you know, the housing levy and campaigns that they're um, uh, lobbying for. So if you're interested in finding out more about what's going on, not just with Plymouth, but with affordable housing in this community, it's a really good uh, site. So housingdevelopmentconsortium.org. Could I make a general observation about, I'm over here in the corner. Over Which corner? Here. I, oh, here at this corner. You don't have to look at me, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Uh, a lot of us are aware of that this goes on, and we all appreciate the kind of work you're doing because it is terribly important, even though, given the numbers you've put up here, the hundreds and hundreds of facilities and rooms you make available is not going to match the thousands and thousands of people who need it. So we, every little bit helps, and this is a great big bit, I think. What I wanted to say was I'm just sorry that Marcia Almquist is not here tonight. She's a resident, and you may know her, and she's been at this for a lifetime, I think. It's a long-term project of hers. Mm -hmm. So when you see her in the hall, whenever it's safe to hug her, um, give her a hug. I think that would be good. She's COVID yeah. now. That's why I say in, when it's safe, give her a hug. Yeah, and so just as a reminder, Marcia was on the board when I was the executive, so 1983, and she was involved before that from Plymouth Congregational Church. Um, you know, the Caldwell Building, the, the pastor at Plymouth Congregational Church that founded, along with Marcia and others, Plymouth Housing Group, they've been at this for 40 years plus. How do you find chronic homelessness? How long have they had to be on the street? Yeah, so I believe, I'm not butchering it, I think I'm correct in saying that it's three times or three episodes of homelessness in a year um, or three years consecutively of homelessness. So the idea of chronic homelessness is that you're in a situation where you're continuously on the street. A lot of the time folks will... Um, you know, maybe stay on someone's couch or something like that. Um, that actually does fit the definition of chronic homelessness because the idea is that you do not have a place that is your own. You're not renting a place. You are in unstable living situations for a prolonged period of time. I, I've got one more question. <laughs> you say it, it takes $25,000 to keep a person in your housing. How much of that is building and how much of that is services? Yeah, so um, it's $25,000 for a permanent supportive housing building, which is what most of ours our, our buildings are. I mentioned we have graduate housing. So the graduate housing costs us about $8,500 per unit per year. So a lot less staffing. We don't have the 24-hour um, staffing, for example. And in the buildings that have permanent supportive housing, about 17,000 then, the difference between the 25 is services, and about 8,500 is uh, the building operations. And so that includes utilities, that includes you know, some basic level of staffing, but not 24-hour staffing, uh, and all of the other um, expenses that go along with operating a building. Got another one here. And I apologize just to back up on the definition of chronic homelessness. It's one year, not three. I, I got those two things mixed up. So it's three episodes of homelessness in a year or one year continuously of homelessness. Just to, to clarify, I knew I had something wrong in there. Can you tell me if there is a... Um, washing machine and dryer room or do the rooms each have individual each facilities? site has laundry rooms on the site I believe every building we have now has them by floor they used to have a cost associated with them so it was 50 cents to wash and 50 cents to launder which or to dry which in the last couple of years had actually increased to 75 cents wash 75 cents dry and then this summer we made it free 
So now when folks have washing and drying to do, instead of us trying to scrounge up change for them or them having to scrounge up change themselves, they can just go to do it. And for individuals in our buildings who are you know, frequently needing to remind, because a lot of our folks haven't had homes for a long time, and some of our daily tasks that we just take for granted, folks don't think about, don't remember to do, we often have to encourage folks to do their laundry. And that was a lot harder to do when we had to say, and also you're gonna have to find a couple bucks to do it too. <laughs> Let's um, give a big thank you to these women for this energy. And, uh, I think when we think about the kind of work they do day in and day out and that they're willing to come this evening and take time to share with us, I just remember how tired I'd be after a day of teaching and I just can't imagine what you might be after a day of work. So thank you so much for the work that you do and for the energetic commitment that you have and positivity about the work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.